thanks again, everybody, for coming today. I hope you all enjoyed our tour. Um, I hope it was informative. Um, we welcome all of you back here whenever you'd like to come. Again, this is a community facility, so um, if you'd like to ask our scouts more questions or ask me more questions, I am welcome setting up time with any of you to come and chat. So um, my portion this morning or this early afternoon um, is to talk about military cultural competency. Um, and what I'm going to do is just kind of talk to you a little bit um, about RP6, but then also kind of what we're seeing um, as far as the population goes as it relates to the, the up and coming legal clinic. So like I said, um, RP6 was founded in 2011 by two US Army veterans who saw the need in the community. Um, I, I explained that in the tour, but um, for sake of, of the training, I'll just kind of recap it. Um, you know, obviously there was a lot of people out in the community who wanted to do something good, and there was a lot of service members who needed the help, but there was no one to make the connection. There was no convener, there was no collaborator, there was no connector. So RP6 was founded in that spirit and continues to operate that mission. So our official mission statement is guiding service members, veterans, and their families to their next objective. So whatever that is. Um, so our process is um, taking them, um, finding out what they need so they can come to us um, for a variety of needs and eight basic pillars. So pillars being employment, education, VA benefits, legal, housing, finance, family support, and volunteerism. So they come to us, they'll indicate what they need help with that day. Um, something that's very surprising for most people is 95% of the people that come to us actually have a need in more than one area. And the average need per person right now is 2.5 needs. So that tells us two things, that transition is multidimensional and is not predictable. And then also that we need a very culturally competent staff to navigate the different resources that are out in the community and become the subject matter experts in every pillar. So service members that come to us, again, I kind of touched on some of the statistics that the general civilian population isn't aware of. Um, and that is 87% uh, of the military does not retire. So that means that the day that they leave, um, their benefits end and their, um, their access to the installation is also back to just like a civilian. So um, it, it's kind of a, a restart, a reset, and they're just pushed into the civilian um, population and expected to go out and make something of their lives. And a lot of times that want is there. Um, but if you think about the average age of a military person, it's 18 to 24, usually a young man, um, obviously, we have a, a surge in women serving as well, but, um, and they've, they joined right after high school. So they uh, get put into the barracks, they get, are given a meal card, and they're taken care of because the focus of that young person's life for the next however many years they're serving is the mission. So they're not having to worry about a budget, and they're not having to worry about a car payment necessarily, and they're not having to worry about pretty much anything except focusing on their mission. Um, the dynamic of the military has changed. 60% are now families. Um, when the all-volunteer force started after 1975, after the end of the draft in the Vietnam War, it was young white males, um, and now a single, and now it is 60% families. So that's another dynamic that the military has had to adjust to. How do you serve a family? How do you serve a spouse and children? And how do you move a whole family unit when that service member is, again, having to be mission focused. And how does a family transition out of the military? So a lot of times you'll see spouses not working for six, eight, nine, 15, 20 years because they haven't been able to. Not because they don't want to, but because they haven't been able to. So 58% of military spouses who want to work outside of the home are not employed. That's a significant statistic that a lot of people don't know or understand. Myself, personal story, I have a master's degree in public policy. I have a BBA undergrad. I had six years of corporate sales experience before my husband joined the military. And I was out of the workforce for six years because my husband moved three different duty stations in five years, including Germany and back. So um, we, I, couldn't, I couldn't have a job. I was not employable. Or I was not, I was not, um, I was not appealing to an employer. So um, 
that's a dynamic that you'll see. So a lot of times people transitioning out, it's how can we help the spouse get a, a significant, meaningful career to help um, in an era in a society where two incomes is kind of the norm to be able to just live. So um, those are some challenges that military families are, cha are experiencing as they transition. Um, and then how that loops back around to legal services. Um, we are seeing very top three critical issues, which we've talked with Sarah and Lori and Beverly about extensively, and Joanne, and that is family law. So things with custody issues, divorces. Um, the divorce rate in the military, unfortunately, is, about, is a little higher than the national average. It's well above 50%. Um, so any type of family type of law issues, bankruptcy, um, is another issue. Um, just again, financial literacy for the average military person is significantly lower than the general population because most of them just didn't ever have the chance to learn how to make a budget. Um, and then the third thing is VA benefits and discharge rating um, adjustments. So obviously everybody kind of knows the current state of the VA, the turmoil that's happening within it. Um, we have a VA benefits person that works here from the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs, and we are have an inbound federal VA benefits person coming. However, there's a point where they end if it's in an appeal and where they need an attorney to help with actual litigation of any of the, the appeal process that happens. So those are three needs that we identified as the top. They're obviously outliers. You know, we'll have people come in and ask us certain questions about certain things. Um, but uh, what's really important to understand is, um, you know, we as, as RP6 and our scouts are not attorneys. So we have this line that we haven't been able to cross um, for liability reasons, and that's why we need all of you. Um, we don't want to even start to trickle into the lane of legal advice um, just for liability purposes. And so it's extremely important to have culturally competent people touching another culturally competent population. Um, and something Lori said, this population is all about trust. Um, they, there's a U new USAA commercial that's running on the radio that's so perfect. They said, trust to most people is a word. Trust to the military is a way of life. Because if you're not trusting the person to your right and your person to your left, that, that's a life and death situation. So what you'll find with the military population is trust is the backbone and the core of their being because they, they depended on it in the battlefield. They depended on it in a training situation. Um, so when they come to us, they, are, they trust us. They trust that we're gonna connect them to the right people. Um, but also they trust us because there's that experiential knowledge. There's that shared social trust because we all are military competent. We're all military veterans or family members, so we understand them. Um, and so that's why it's really important to have a legal clinic in a veteran service organization facility because they're going to trust the place they're coming and then that reciprocal effect is they're all going to trust all of you. So um, I know there are, there are several veterans in this room, several spouses, so thank you for your service. Um, and I think that's just going to add to the value of um, what we're, we're doing here. Um, and the final thing that I would say is volume. You know, we see on average over 50 legal needs a month. So those are 50 needs that we may or may not have been able to successfully help because we send them to a clinic but we don't know if they get there or we don't know where to send them. <laughs> um, and honestly then we just try to call an attorney that maybe doesn't have time to help or it's been a very disparate black hole a little bit. Um, so very, very thankful for this coordinated body coming here this is the epitome of our mission, sitting in our room. So I just want to thank you all for that. And again, I'm here for any questions, comments, or um, meeting at any time after this. And just want to thank you all for your service to those who served and continuing to serve. Thank you very much.